Welcome, Generals, to Logan's Crossroads. This is Ultimate General Civil War with version 1.28.3 of the JMP mod. I am playing the Union on Major General Difficulty. First, thank you for taking the time to check out any of my materials related to the game. I know they take some time, just as the game is a big time commitment to play either campaign through all 38 battles. I also want to provide a little bit of a disclaimer. For those of you that are unaware, Colonel, Brigadier General, and Major General difficulties all share an AI profile. Legendary has its own profile. Therefore, things that you see me do should easily translate to lower difficulties, but may not work in Legendary or be suboptimal. Some gaming content creators focus on min-maxing their gameplay. Some create who-knows-what's-going-to-happen type of content, like when Fourfall streams Iron Man style. Mine are more about what I happen to be doing at the moment, and I share the things that I've learned, whether it was from playing the game, watching other players' videos, chatting with Pandakraut, or just picking up things off the Discord and the Reddit pages. I pretty much swim in the Major General pool, and I dabble in Legendary. I also play the USA about 80% of the time compared to the CSA. With each of the battles leading up to Shiloh, I've tried to cover some of the game mechanics or opportunity costs that affect your decisions in the game. I discussed career points during the Philippi video, scaling, intelligence reports, and variants with Distress Call, how to get two-star units at Bull Run and maximize your time for that battle, with River Crossing, I covered how units gain experience and how I get as many veteran units as possible to Shiloh. Initially, I intended to cover how to deal with charges in the Shiloh video, but given the length of that battle, I've decided to cover that here with Logan's Crossroads. There are two distinct discussions. One is the mechanics involved with melee combat in the game, and the other is how to prevent, stop, and mitigate charge damage. I gave my two-star infantry units a Tier 2 accuracy perk in the River Crossing video. I had said that some variables related to melee combat do not come into play when you're just shooting at everything. Therefore, taking accuracy perks makes things simple. You do what you can to avoid melee and focus fire on the closest units, then, once an enemy is routing, you use melee calf to force a surrender or a shatter. Using this strategy makes life easier. Melee engagements are like playing games of skill, where the player can tilt the odds in their favor, then bet high when the conditions are right. Texas Hold'em Poker allows the player to see the cards in their hand and those on the table. They must calculate the odds that their cards can beat the other players. It's a matter of playing the odds when the conditions are right. Understanding the variables will help you decide when the odds are in your favor and when to wait. You won't always win, even when the odds are in your favor, but statistically, you'll win more often than you lose. Melee can be more rewarding than accuracy, but more risk is involved. I am not arguing for or against melee perks. I'd like to explore a melee heavy army myself at some point. My purpose here is to inform you of the factors involved so you can go into melee engagements well informed and make good decisions. Everything that I'm about to tell you is correct as of version 1.28.3. The most significant factors in melee combat are melee perks, the melee unit stat, the melee damage of the weapon, unit condition, unit morale, unit size, and the number of units actively in the melee engagement. These factors directly affect melee damage and will be the focus of this discussion. Terrain and cover also affect melee damage, especially for CAV, but I won't be discussing those. I also won't be discussing unit stamina or any perks that boost speed or decrease morale damage taken. These things indirectly affect melee damage by allowing a unit to fight in melee longer before unit condition or morale drops. The AI is disadvantaged in the game because its perks are randomly assigned. 
there isn't any consistency or optimization in building an army towards leveraging shooting or melee like the player, or at least for now. To help compensate for its lack of optimization, the AI algorithm calculates the melee and ranged strength of its units and the players. The AI uses that information and many other calculations to decide what action to take. These calculations account for all seven melee-related factors for any player unit the AI can see. That is, for any player unit that does not have the closed eye icon displayed. As more player units come into view, the AI will recalculate and may change actions. By comparison, a player does not know the AI unit condition, perks, melee stat, or weapon early in the game. We know the AI unit size, morale, and the number of units that are in the melee. With 10 and recon, the player can determine the AI unit's weapon and condition, but still cannot see the unit's perks or melee unit stat. If you are using CAV to sweep up routing AI units, this missing information isn't essential since the risk is low. However, if you plan to melee regularly with your infantry, then having 10 and recon is recommended. So we know the factors and what information can be seen by the player. Let's talk about how melee damage is determined. The damage done in melee starts with the weapon's melee rating and is then modified by unit perks and the unit melee stat first. We then have several secondary modifiers that can be significant. Melee is affected by morale and condition. Modifiers for morale start with 1.1 at Heroic and drop to 0.35. Modifiers for condition also start at 1.1 when the unit is fresh, but drop to 0.1 when it is exhausted. Efficiency affects your ability to kill things, whether shooting or melee. Heroic morale gives a unit modifier of 1, but tanks down to 0.25 when routing. Similarly, a unit with fresh condition gets a unit modifier of 1.2 but drops to 0.2 when exhausted. Larger units will do more damage than smaller units in melee, and a single unit that is in melee with multiple units receives a penalty. However, in the mod, do not think that being larger or using multiple units will compensate for significant morale and condition penalties. Size and counter charging with multiple units will only be helpful when your condition and morale are good or the enemy unit's morale and condition are low. The only way of knowing the AI unit's perks and stats is if we capture them. In our Texas Hold'em Poker analogy, these are the two cards that we won't know until it is over and by then it'll be too late. Even though the AI already knows our cards. So how bad could it be? What can we assume about the AI perks and stats? Regarding the AI unit stats, to compound the issue of unknowns even more, sometimes the AI unit defaults at a battle or program to encourage it to take specific actions. For example, here is a screenshot of Anderson at Logan's Crossroads after I captured him. This unit will be in this battle. This is a one-star unit with a melee stat of 60. Notice that all of the other stats are in a small range of 36 to 44. As a player, it is unlikely that you are going to have a melee unit stat of 60 by the fifth battle of the campaign. But the AI can have these sorts of things if the original programmers wanted the AI algorithm to charge more at a certain battle, which is what happens at Logan's Crossroads. Now, with that said, the CSA doesn't have a core commander at Logan's Crossroads. So part of me wonders if maybe the melee unit stat boost is the programmer's way of making up for not having a core commander perk here. I'm just speculating. The higher you go in the game difficulty level, the more of a discrepancy you will see between the starting experience of your units and the experience of the AI units. Therefore, you should assume that the AI has higher unit stats than you. 
Let's switch our attention to what we can assume about AI unit perks. The infantry gives players trouble regarding charges, so I will discuss the charge perks for infantry and corps commanders. The numbers will be different for CAV, but the same thinking will still apply. Infantry and corps commanders can have Tier 1 and Tier 2 charge perks. Tier 3 doesn't include a melee bonus for charging, even though they have the speed, a morale damage reduction. Each charge perk for the infantry and commander will give a 25% melee bonus when charging. The perks are additive, so the maximum bonus is 100% melee bonus when charging. By comparison, infantry can have 135% accuracy bonus from perks, 95% from their own perks, and 40% from the commander. Obviously, the more stars a unit has, the greater the odds they will have charge perks. So what is the chance that any given infantry unit will have a charge perk? Well, these numbers show the odds of a unit having anywhere from 0 to 4 charge perks. The first line is for a 1 star unit without a commander. Since there are only 2 tier 1 perks, the odds are 1 and 2, or 50%, that they will have either accuracy or charge. The second line is for a 2 star unit without a commander. The table shows the possible perk combinations. The odds are 1 in 6, or 16.6%, .6 of having 2 charge perks. 3 out of 5, or a 60% chance of having 1 perk. And then 2 out of 6, or a 33.3% chance of having no charge perk. Line 3 is for a 1 star unit with a Brigadier General Commander. The table shows the possible perk combinations. Since the commander has a 1 in 3 chance of having a charge perk, the odds and percentages are the same as line 2. Line 4 is for a major general or a lieutenant general commander to have charge perks. Again, the combinations are in the table. The odds are 1 in 9 of having 2, 4 in 8 of having 1 charge perk, and 4 in 9 of having none. Most players will not have a Major General Corps Commander until Malvern or Second Bull Run, but the AI will likely have them sooner. Line 5 is for a 2-star unit with a Major General. Since neither the infantry nor commanders have plus to charge at Tier 3, then these numbers also apply to 3-star units and Lieutenant Generals. There are 54 possible combinations. The odds are 1 in 54 of having 4 charge perks, which is 1.8%. That leaves 7 out of the remaining 53 combinations, or 13.2%, that the unit will have 3 charge perks. 18 of the remaining 43 combinations are 2 perks, which is 39.13%. And 20 of the remaining 28 combinations have 1 perk, which is 71.4%. Lastly, only 8 of the 54 combinations will result in no charge perks. So, what does this data tell us, and what can we conclude from it? To be safe, you should assume that any infantry unit has at least one charge perk. It also tells me that over 55% of the time, non-infantry units will also have a charge perk from the Corps Commander. In version 1.28.3 of the mod, units not charging get 50% of any charge bonus as a melee bonus. That means about 55% of the time, enemy artillery has a 12.5% melee bonus if you charge them without damaging their condition or morale first. The data also suggests that if I have two charge perks on my infantry units, then I'm going to be even or possibly even ahead of the AI on average. One of the problems with the data is in how many commanders the AI can have on the field in a battle. When led by a major general or a lieutenant general, we can see 54 perk combinations for two-star infantry units. 
The data is statistically correct for the game because the units and commanders can have any combination before a battle starts. However, to see 54 combinations in a battle, the AI would need at least 9 core commanders with a minimum of 6 infantry units under each. Although it would be rare, you could have at least one combination of each statistically. In reality, the AI is never going to deploy 9 core commanders. 4 or 5 core commanders at grand battles are closer to normal. Once a battle starts, the odds listed of having melee perks will skew higher when commanders have charge perks and skew lower when they do not. Of course, we cannot know the AI core commander perks, but there is a way to infer the AI units are packing melee perks. In this series, I've mentioned several times that getting your focused fire timing down is one of the biggest keys to stopping charges and succeeding in the game. You need to be able to quickly evaluate a charging unit and know how much firepower it'll take to route it based on its speed and the number of units you can dedicate to firing. Many charge perks are paired with morale damage reductions from fire or melee. With enough experience, you can start to estimate how many charge perks a unit may have based on how quickly you can decrease its morale. This is probably a good time to transition to how to prevent, stop, and mitigate charge damage. As I explained earlier, the AI algorithm accounts for all melee-related factors when deciding on an action. Not only does having poor condition and low morale reduce your ability to fight, but they also invite the AI to charge more often because the algorithm shows that you are vulnerable. Here you see a heroic walker charging into a group of my infantry who are all tired. I try to avoid my units getting below 70% condition and morale if I can help it. Whenever a unit gets into the low 70s, I try to stop using them until morale and condition are back over 95%. A second way to prevent charges is to have your own charge perks. When the AI calculates a course of action, it decides if it's better off to attack using melee or shooting. The more charge perks your units have, the more often the AI will decide to stand and shoot. As you have seen in this series, you can also use dedicated skirmishers to temporarily prevent infantry units from charging. Currently, the AI is not allowed to charge detached skirmishers or cavalry. Detached skirmishers will not hold off infantry for long, but they can screen for infantry units that are falling back or those that are recovering morale and condition. Detached skirmishers tend to be a prime target for charging AI cav, so you need to be mindful of their location and not create large gaps between your infantry and your screening detached skirmishers. Stopping charges can be achieved in a variety of ways. The most common will be focused fire on the charging units. Groups of artillery can be placed on hot key to quickly rotate between targets. Infantry in your defensive line should be able to support each other by having three or more fire at the closest charging unit. When there's room to maneuver, carbine and pistol calves should move to fire into the flanks of charging units. This is also true of skirmishers, but make sure that they're not blocking the infantry from firing. Typically, four to six units firing together is enough focused fire to cause a charging unit to stop and route. If you don't have enough units to stop a charging unit, you can practice timing your smoothbores to fire when the charging unit comes into canister range. Smoothbores and canister range can drop enemy unit morale in a hurry. If the unit that is being charged has room to fall back, you can buy yourself some time by having that unit fall back while the other units continue to flank. This also helps to isolate and surround a charging unit to better force a surrender or a shatter. Sometimes you can cause a charging unit to cancel its charge by moving a hidden unit forward so the AI can see it, or clicking on fallback when you have plenty of support. 
Just remember that canceled charges in this mod version do not require a full cooldown and that the AI may charge again soon. Sometimes the unit being charged must hold its ground and you make a judgment call. If your unit has better morale than the charging unit, you can try to wait until the last second and counter charging just long enough to force the enemy to rout, then pull back. If your unit doesn't have better morale and there's no room to maneuver cav, you can park your cav right on top of the unit being charged to fire at the charging unit and then have your cav and infantry unit counter charge. This double stacking can also be done with other infantry units. Avoid countercharging with multiple units if your units have low condition or morale. Units in melee get a morale regen bonus for making kills. That means that sending units that the AI can easily kill is feeding the shark and causing a feeding frenzy that prolongs the engagement. If multiple AI units are charging, I first focus fire on the most dangerous. I consider the most dangerous to be the one with the most stars and the highest morale. If all charging units have the same stars, then the largest unit with the highest morale is my priority. If they all seem equal, fire at the closest one first. Remember that the AI must only recover 50% of its morale before charging a second time. 50% morale usually means that it needs to have a confident morale state, but it can still be in a steady morale state when it hits 50%. When an AI unit charges for the first time, assume its condition is high, even if you route it. Countercharging units is less risky when they have less condition and keep coming back. No matter how good you get at preventing, stopping, and countering charges, some will always get through. With experience, you can know early when you won't be able to stop a charge. It is nearly always better to let one unit take the hit and have the rest focus fire into the melee to route the AI unit. When you know that you cannot stop a charge, try to move any vulnerable units out of the way. You also may need to turn your infantry or cavalry so they don't accidentally get sucked into the melee. All right, I hope that gave you a good idea of how melee works and the factors that you should consider when deciding to charge. Let's take a quick look at the status of my army before fighting Logan's Crossroads. Woods and Scales both got their second star at River Crossing, and since they're both smooth bores, I gave them the cover and canister perk. I didn't expect any other units to get a star at the battle. Since most of the units just fought in their first battle, I will not review all the experience. The expectation is that everyone will get their first star at Logan's Crossroads, with the exception of Bliss, Peabody, and maybe Frank. I put my career point from River Crossing into Recon. I want to get it to 6 for Shiloh. I also bought the Lorenz Rifles with rep points. The five units sitting out this time are Wagner, Brewster, Lepian, Braxton, and Grimes. That means that I'll have no stars on any of my infantry units, and they will have the maximum morale penalty for buying the Lorenzes. Hey, if I can pull it off, then you will have the confidence to know that you can do it with better units, right? I'll be taking both of my cav and all of my artillery, which includes four two-star batteries. I'm taking McDowell, Sherman, Franklin, Porter, Enzelman, Brooks, Frank, Martin, Peabody, McKean, Bliss, Woods, Walton, Loomis, and Scales. Porter got beat up at River Crossing, so I used up my vets getting him put back together. I have 25,000 in supply. The intelligence reports show 14,000 recruits being sent to the AI Army. On the core deploy screen, the AI has 14,651 troops and 34 guns versus my 12,910 and 68 guns. The AI force may be bigger in battle, it just depends on the splits.
In version 1.28, you cannot give up the VP, so I use four infantry and four artillery to set up a V. Think of the northern arm of the V as being in the 9 o'clock position, and the southern arm being around 7.30. It takes a while to deal with AI troops in the wooded area, so I'll only send units into the northwest woods at the end of the battle. The farm and fortifications at the VP will be my defensive line that I hold steady for much of the battle. The southern leg of my V formation will gradually run in a counterclockwise motion, sweeping all the way around the battlefield until the last of the CSA forces are in the northwest woods, and I'll finish them there. I have four units with 42 Springfields or muskets. Their weapons have the best melee stats and reload faster, so they're going onto the field first. I'm also starting with Woods' two-star unit with 24-pound howitzers. As much as I would like to get my other two-star smoothbores on the field at the start, I'm deploying my three batteries that do not have a horse perk, so I don't have to wait for them. The other two-star units have horse perks with Napoleons, so I'm counting on them to be able to get into support position quickly. Artillery being able to flip 180 degrees to fire comes in pretty handy here. My detached skirmishers will prevent the AI from charging while I'm waiting for my units. Then I'll move them to the side to get the charges going. The timer for getting the rest of your units is short, so my cav will be here pretty quickly to help with charging units. As my reinforcements come in, the ones to the north are just beefing up the defensive line, and the ones coming into the south will sweep the southern woods and flank the CSA units coming in from that area. Scales and Walton's two-star Napoleon units will be helping to flank and push on the southern side.
With infantry approaching, I will move my detached out of the way to allow them to charge. Ideally, I want to capture, shatter, and do as much damage as possible to the initial CSA units and then swing my southern defensive line around to about 5 o'clock before the CSA reinforcements arrive. Pond is charging, and Gibson and Anderson will likely be right behind him. My detached are flanking. I have room for my cav to maneuver on the southern side, but not on the north. Looks like Martin is split on the north side. If you're new to the mod or haven't played in a long time, getting your timing down for how much fire you can get on a charging unit to route them can take some practice. Same with how close your calf can get before they get sucked into the melee inadvertently. Steven's two stars charging, but they are already wavering. Here comes Jackson right behind Stevens. I don't have room to maneuver Cav on the north side without taking a bunch of flanking shots. When that's the case, I tend to just park my Cav on top of the infantry to fire. Woods' 24-pound howitzers are firing a canister range on Jackson, so he's not going to last long. Gibbs and Anderson's turn.
All right, the initial wave of charges on the south side is finished. So I'll start mobilizing my southern forces to push the line forward and sweep the southern area to clear it. I didn't intend to drift into Anderson. I need to get my KF pulled back before Pond comes off and wavering and starts to fire at them. I have enough units on the north side that I'm not worried about charges from that direction now. I do want to shift some of the units to the right. There are always some snipers in the woods northeast of the VP that are hard to detect, so I'll have to deal with them pretty soon. Gibson and Anderson are coming back for round two with the minimum required morale to charge. And you can bet their condition isn't great, so we'll try to capture these guys.
I hate charging with no star units, but Henselman would end up in double melee anyway, so I may as well push back as long as possible. There's Anderson's one star with the 60 melee unit stat that I discussed in camp. I will pull Henselman back to recover a bit and move Franklin up to replace him on the line. Menzies Cav are coming in from the southeast, which is normal. You never know when they'll decide to engage. I need these snipers to go away or they'll rack up a lot of kills. CSA reinforcements are starting to arrive. Their dedicated skirmishers are right there flanking my KF. Martin's going to get banged up here. I don't know if I can extract these surrendered skirmishers, but we'll see. I'm sending my KF into the northeast woods to rest for a few minutes. I need to get my defensive line in shape and move my guns up to support.
Lindsay's wavering, so I'll try to get him the route. Going to shift Franklin down and let Henselman get back in here. Probably push Russell back in time for Stewart to charge. Gale's canister just routed Henselman and Stewart, but there wasn't much that I could do. If I hadn't countercharged with Henselman, then Scales would have been overrun. I could start harassing the CSA artillery so they can't support their infantry. Normally, I would push Lindsay out of the south and keep sweeping my defensive line up to the 3 o'clock position and have four or five detached working with the calf to push the artillery from the south. But my guys resting in the north for a bit, it just worked out that they happened to be in the right place to charge down and get one of them.
Lindsay's calf is not destroyed yet, so I'm a little nervous about my detached and tired calf operating over here alone. This is what happens when you have a lot of no star units in battle. With low unit stats, they don't have enough stamina to fight for a long time. I've gotten lucky so far that Lindsay hasn't been more aggressive with charging.
Let's eliminate this artillery battery and swing the defensive line up. Most of the CSA are now moving into the Northwest Woods. That's where the battle will end. If I can get Tyler to route, my calf will be safe to come up and take him. Should have done a better job of managing condition. My infantry are basically inefficient meat shields right now for my artillery to do most of the killing. If I had brought more of my veteran infantry, things would go much smoother here, but the opportunity cost would be not getting as many rookies up to one star before Shiloh, and I'd rather have more one stars at that battle than this one.
I'm starting to run low on time for the battle since it ends at 8.30, but I also want to rest some of these guys before I push into the woods where killing is less efficient to begin with. You could easily make an argument for pushing the CSA out of the north woods to start the battle so the end is more out in the open, and I've done that, but about a third of the time I can't finish the job and get into place for the CSA reinforcements in time, so I've stopped doing that.
As I said in camp, the CSA does not have a unit commander at this battle, so I wonder if that's why the infantry have buffed default melee stats to make up for not having the commander perk. I'm not sure, but it would make sense. I had 536 killed, 1,643 wounded, 195 missing. I killed about 8,000 total AI units and captured 1,377. All my infantry did just fine on kills. Henselman had a low number at river crossing, so he needed to make up for it here, but everyone looks good. Porter got beat up again, but he had more kills than anyone else. Artillery did well, though it looks like I lost two Napoleons, a six-pounder, and I was one man short of losing a 24-pounder. Cav did fine, but I worked them too hard and should have let them rest. Most of their losses came from dealing with those detached skirmishers and getting flanked. There was no promotions, but nobody was killed or wounded either. As I said before, River Crossing and Logan's Crossroads don't give you much regarding weapons quality, although that's likely to change. The latest test version of the mod has given all difficulty levels the same weapons quality defaults as Legendary, so it's likely that better weapons will start appearing after Bull Run rather than after Shiloh. The 56 Enfields for Skirmishers... The carbines and the 12-pound howitzers are about the only thing I really want from this group of captures. The rebores and the 42 Springfields will help put more men on the field for Shiloh. All my level 88 colonels have gotten their first star. McKean's artillery also made it. Looks like Frank and Peabody are the only ones that didn't, which doesn't surprise me. I knew Bliss wouldn't when I created them, so that wasn't even expected. We'll see what kind of force I can put together in camp for Shiloh and see how it goes. Thank you so much for spending some of your valuable time watching today. I hope that you've picked up a few things that you can apply to your own campaigns, and I wish you much success, Generals. I'm off to Shiloh.